Uh, this program is funded in part by the Arlington Libraries Foundation. Um, the Arlington Libraries Foundation is a primary fundraiser for the Robbins and Fox branch, branch Library and is dedicated to helping open the doors to all who are curious, creating an inclusive space for the Arlington community and ensuring the library's future as the cornerstone of the community for generations to come. Uh, so we're very grateful to them. We have books for sale from the three authors. Uh, the books are in the back of the room, and I am wearing many hats, and I will also be your bookseller tonight. So if you would like to purchase a book, you will need to wait until I am back there at the end of the reading. Um, but I know the authors would be very happy to sign books uh, after they read, and uh, it would be wonderful if you could support our local independent bookstore, the Book Rack, and our author readers. And without further ado, I will get going. So our first reader tonight is Jennifer Haig. And Jennifer is the author of seven books of fiction, which I'm, uh, it's, it's very cool. <laughs> and most recently, Mercy Street, named a best book of 2022 by The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and The Boston Globe. Published in 18 languages, her books have won the Bridge Prize, the Penn Hemingway Award, the Massachusetts Book Award, the Penn New England Award in Fiction, and a Literature Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her short stories have been published in Granta, The Atlantic, The Best American Short Stories, and many other places. A Guggenheim Fellow, she teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at Boston University. Let's welcome Jennifer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're, we're in a cafe. Um, well, I'm thrilled to be here tonight to uh, talk about my novel, Mercy Street. Uh, the photos behind me um, will bring back some probably traumatic memories to some of you of the winter of 2015. And that's when this novel is set, during the snowpocalypse. Um, and anybody who was in the Boston area at that time remembers it very vividly. Um, it is really uh, central to this novel, that feeling of, of isolation, of being under siege that we all had in that time. Um, so Mercy Street is the first novel I've ever written that really is out of my own experience. I, I don't have an autobiographical instinct at all as a writer, so this is all new for me. I spent some years uh, working as a volunteer counselor in a women's clinic that did abortions. And in my time there, I, uh, I went through a training and then I answered calls on a hotline. So the callers were uh, women who needed to make appointments for a variety of things, they needed contraception, they needed pelvic exams, and about half of them uh, wanted to schedule abortions. If you wanted to terminate a pregnancy, your first step at this clinic was to talk to a volunteer like me. Um, so I would you know, talk about the procedure, answer their questions, and then they could make their appointment. So this novel, Mercy Street, has at its center uh, a counselor named Claudia Birch, um, she's not a volunteer as I was, she's an actual psychologist who um, handles all the counseling at this clinic. And she supervises the people who work on the hotline. So I'm going to read to you from a section of Claudia at work at the clinic on a fictional Boston street called Mercy Street. The waiting room was bright and cheerful, painted a sunny yellow. There were comfortable chairs, Tables stacked with cooking and decorating magazines, boxes of Kleenex strategically placed. One wall was covered with giant photographs taken by the director's son while he was in the Peace Corps, smiling African women in colorful dresses, carrying bundles on their backs, shoulders, and heads. They carried water jugs, bushel baskets of bread or fruit or laundry. They carried all the things you'd expect them to carry, except babies. Claudia crossed the waiting room and continued down a long hallway to a call center. The door was open a crack. A woman was talking on the phone, a voice Claudia recognized. Naomi had worked on the hotline for as long as there had been one, her most dedicated volunteer. What was the first day of your last menstrual period, Naomi asked. This was always the first question. The call center was packed with cubicles. Each held a desktop computer and a standard issue office telephone. At each workstation was posted a printed notice, silent call procedure. 
In the corner cube, Naomi consulted her chart, a cardboard wheel the size of a floppy disk, to calculate gestational age. The younger volunteers used the online version, but Naomi was old school. She hunched over her wheel like a medieval soothsayer, reading tarot or tea leaves. You are eight weeks and five days pregnant, she said. The volunteers came in two varieties. Half were gray-haired, old enough to remember illegal abortions, some from personal experience, Pam, Naomi, Janet, Karen. The rest were grad students in psychology or social work or public health, Megan, Amanda, Lily, Marisol. They were called counselors, but it was a poor description of the work they did. College to the hotline needed many things, information, appointments, decent jobs, any sort of health insurance, childcare, affordable housing, antibiotics, antidepressants. Council, honestly, was pretty far down the list. This was especially true for AB calls. By the time a woman Googled abortion Boston, she wasn't looking for advice from a stranger. Her decision was already made. The counselor told her what to expect on the day of the appointment, how long the procedure would take, 10 to 15 minutes, how long she'd spend at the clinic, two hours, including recovery, what to eat that morning, nothing, what to bring with her, socks and a sweater, the procedure room could get chilly. Are you diabetic, Naomi asked. Do you take methadone, suboxone, or subutex? Claudia slipped on a headset and settled in at her desk. They explained the procedure and answered questions. Will I be awake? Will it hurt? Those were common questions, but not the most common. The most common question was, how much does it cost? The first set of pills is mifepristone, said Naomi. You'll take those here in our clinic. The second set is misoprostol. You take those later at home. More and more women were choosing the medication AB over the in-clinic procedure. Either method without insurance cost $650, a drop in the ocean compared to the cost of raising a child, but for many of the callers, it was an unimaginable sum. Holy shit, Claudia had been told more than once, looks like I'm gonna have a kid. Her first call was a pill question. As the caller spoke, Claudia took the following notes. Started pack three days late, missed two white, took week two, missed one pink, only green left. She had long since mastered the pill question, having heard every possible variation. Started late, started early, vomited up a white one, took two pink ones by mistake. She could answer a pill question in under a minute in English, Spanish, or Haitian Creole. You'll need to use a backup method, she said. Condoms for the rest of your cycle. The caller was unhappy to hear this. No one was ever happy to hear this. It's those white pills I'm worried about. Unless you take them consistently the first week, you're not protected. The moment she disconnected, the line rang again. The second caller gave her name, Tara. In the background, a television was playing. Claudia recognized the opening music of Dr. Phil, the Texas twang of the doctor himself, testifying like a revival tent preacher. This is going to be a change in day in your life. What was the day of your last menstrual period? Claudia asked. Tara was nine weeks pregnant, HIV positive, and sleeping on a stranger's couch. She took methadone, but not regularly, lithium, but not recently. She lit cigarettes one after the other, scratch, pause, inhale. At 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, she was already high. As she spoke, Claudia thought of the word problems she'd solved in high school algebra, Trains traveling at different speeds in opposite directions. How long before their paths intersect? The problem always was knowing which variable to solve for. Tara's life was a burning building with a fire on each floor. Which fire did you put out first? Tara had only one question. $650, Claudia said. You put out the pregnancy first. What would become of Tara? Claudia would never know. The hotline was a portal into a stranger's life, ambient traffic and distant sirens, kids playing in English or Spanish or Portuguese or Hmong, music playing, a dog barking, a child crying, 
a video game that must have been popular because she kept hearing it. The catchy electronic jingle, the cartoon gunfire with its plosive reports. A dog crying, a child barking, running water, dishwashing, ice cubes tinkling in a glass. Always there was a television. Even in the throes of a personal crisis, it didn't occur to the caller to turn off the TV. Some counselors found this noise distracting. Claudia barely noticed it, having grown up in such a household. Her mother, Deb, had been a nurse's aide at the county retirement home. She came from work exhausted and often in physical pain, and the first thing she did always was turn on the TV and light a cigarette, her reward for getting through another day. That's what they called it, the county home, which sounded nicer than what it really was a place for indigent old people to get older and eventually die, a process that sometimes took forever and sometimes only seemed to. For most of Claudia's childhood, they lived in a single wide trailer, not a double wide. If you know anything at all about mobile homes, you know that the difference is profound. A double wide feels like a house because of the way it's constructed in two separate halves that are bolted together on site. A single is all one piece like a shipping container. And like a shipping container, it gets hot in summer and cold in winter. In a main winter, it gets very cold, and a crying child produces a strange echo. It's impossible to forget ever that you're living in a can. On the plus side, a single is cheap and easy to get. Claudia's mother bought theirs at an RV lot. No mortgage, no credit check. She hauled it away herself hitched to a truck her brother had borrowed from work. When Claudia thinks of the trailer, she remembers the carpet. Wall-to-wall -wall acrylic shag, the pile so long and dense that it seemed to suck in whatever landed on it. Spilled milk, puzzle pieces, Smarties, cat food, thumbtacks, melting popsicles, Lego blocks. The trailer was 50 feet long and 18 across. Claudia has lived in smaller places, but never with so many people or such small windows. There was a kitchen and a living room. A bathroom and two tiny bedrooms opened off a narrow hallway. Later, to accommodate the Fosters, her Uncle Ricky built a flimsy addition, two by fours and fiberglass insulation and sloppy drywall with a skin of Tyvek home wrap. In point of fact, her childhood home was half house, half trailer, they were the sort of people who built onto their trailer. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. Uh, our next reader tonight is going to be Josh Barkin. Josh won the Light Ship International Short Story Prize and was runner-up for the Grace Paley Prize for Short Fiction, the Patterson Fiction Prize, and the Juniper Prize for Fiction. He is the recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and his writing has appeared in Esquire. He's taught writing at creative, he's taught creative writing at Harvard, NYU, the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa, Hollins, and MIT. His books include the novel Blind Speed and the short story collections Before Hiroshima and Mexico, named one of the five best story collections of 2017 by Library Journal. Um, his newest book, Wonder, Wonder Travel, came out really recently, just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome, Josh. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, it was really amazing hearing Jennifer read and hearing that uh, description of the, the sound of the baby crying in the trailer that really gets to me um, in the mobile home. In any case, I'm going to be reading from my new uh, memoir, Wonder Travels. And as Whitney was just saying, this came out about two weeks ago. Um, this is a memoir that is really about healing and overcoming after discovering that my wife of 15 years had had an affair and the end of our marriage. Um, in 2007 to 8, she went on a trip around the world for six months. And she went to Syria, to Israel, India, um, a number of countries. And during that trip, towards the end of her trip, she met someone named, who I call Muhammad in the memoir, and she had a relationship with him, came back to New York City where we had been living together, 
Um, and I could tell that something was different, something had changed, but I couldn't tell what, and certainly didn't expect that she had had an affair. Um, after a couple of months, she decided to go to Spain, where she was from originally. She's a Spanish citizen. And she said that she was going to go back to Spain where her sister was going to have a baby. Um, this seemed only unusual because she had 16 other nieces and nephews and she had never gone back to see any of them born uh, in Spain. So something seemed quite different. Soon after she got back to, to Spain, got to Spain, um, she told me a couple days later that she was going to go to the island of Ibiza, which I don't know if any of you have ever been to Ibiza or know about it, but it's, it's an island in the Mediterranean and it's, it's really a place you go if you just want to party frankly, if you want to just go to clubs, et cetera. So it seemed very unusual given that she had said she was going back to uh, see her sister have this child. And rather than going to Ibiza, though, she actually went back to see Mohammed, back to be with him, back to continue the relationship in Morocco. All communication was eventually cut off, and I became quite concerned. And the part I'm going to read to you is after this three-week period, 12 days of no communication, um, and just being told by a friend of mine uh, that she had been having this relationship with Muhammad. Her few prized possessions from her childhood are in that box. There are boxes of letters in there from the little correspondence she's been able to keep. When she came to the US, she wrote letters regularly to her family back in Spain, but they rarely replied. And there are some love letters in there Letters which tell her that I have always been suspicious of romantics who write their names on the beach, who send each other flowers, but that this is how I feel about her, that I love her completely and unconditionally. There's another letter from four years before where I tell her I know there are things I would like to keep improving to continue to be a better husband, but that I feel this has been the best year of our lives together, that she is realizing her dreams of being in the magazine world, and that I love her. There are boxes of photos from our trips on the shores of Maine and New Brunswick and Grand Manan, where we regularly go camping, and from the bottom of the Grand Canyon in the middle of winter, from China, Burma, Cambodia, Thailand, and Spain, and photos of us celebrating an after-marriage party in Spain two years after we eloped, in which my two grandmothers and uncles and aunt and parents flew to Spain for the small get-together of 40, just her immediate family and a few of her friends. What am I supposed to do with these photos? I can't look through them all. It's too unbearable, and I put them back. She will return soon if she comes home, and I don't feel safe. I gather my financial records together and leave a box with my neighbors. I take my grandfather's old, somewhat broken Rolex and a copy of all the computer files on our desktop and I take all the belongings in our safety deposit box, which are mine, and I get a new safety deposit box. It's crazy, I know. What could she possibly do to me? But it doesn't feel crazy. It feels prudent, smart. I've been told by two friends to protect myself. I've been lied to, and I feel I know nothing about what she values anymore. An affair, the way she is dis disrespecting us, shatters the myth we share the same values. An affair is something I have told myself in the past I would never do. When she was on her long six-month trip, I saw a beautiful woman on the subway platform, and it was the middle of winter, and my wife had been gone on her trip for four months at the time, and I was lonely. And I thought about that woman on the platform, imagining a relationship with her. But I knew I would never act on that impulse out of respect for us. And when a couple of weeks later I saw her again and felt the same impulse, I still didn't act on it, even though two strangers rarely meet again in the subway of New York. What do we share anymore after she has lied and gone back to Morocco? Once, meeting him on her, meeting him on her trip, I can understand a moment of impulse, of human frailty, even if she was with him for five nights. But after she has created a whole complicated lie, claiming she's in Ibiza when she has really gone back to see him, this is not a moment. This is premeditated. This is willful. And if she is under his sway, enamored by him, who knows where things are headed?
The night before she's supposed to come back, I meet with her friend downstairs, who she's installed in the building, who has left her husband after 28 years. I tell her I believe Luciana has had an affair in Morocco when she was on her long trip. I say nothing about Ibiza and the present. I tell her this, and I see her begin to tear up. I tell her this because I suspect she's in contact with my wife in Morocco, and at this point, I don't mind if word leaks back to her, I know what's up, because I just want her to come home so we can talk. I tell her I don't know how I'll respond when my wife comes home, but that I hope to respond calmly. I tell her I've been thinking a lot about Gandhi, about how the best way to respond to someone is with nonviolence, for only they can judge themselves if they are to absorb what they have done. She tells me she's seen a pop psychology show on TV in which the host suggests in a time of confrontation one can choose to do nothing, not doing anything as a choice. She is clearly suggesting I should not act violently when she comes home. Another friend who I have met for coffee, the screenplay writer with the apartment where we had the coming home party for Luciana after a trip, asked me if I feel like hitting her when she comes home or acting violently. I tell him no. I tell him I don't believe in that kind of violence. I tell him we've never screamed at each other or fought physically before. The day before she comes home, I call her mother in Spain to ask if she's returned from Ibiza to Madrid. Her mother says she thinks she has and that she's staying with one of her siblings. I try to contain my emotions over the phone, and I tell her I have reason to suspect her daughter has been in a relationship with another man. Her mother says she doesn't believe this. I tell her I have strong reasons to suspect she's been in Morocco instead of Ibiza. Her mother is confused. I tell her if she doesn't believe me, she should talk to one of her other daughters, who has used her frequent flyer miles to purchase the ticket to Morocco for Luciana instead of to Ibiza. I tell her mother I'm only mentioning this because I want her to pass on to her daughter the reassurance that she should just come home, that everything will be all right, and that she shouldn't be afraid of coming home. Are you sure you want me to tell her that, she says. No, I say, only tell her that if she doesn't get on the plane. I just want her to come home so we can lay everything out openly on the table. I don't want any violence. And if she's afraid to come home, I want her to know everything will be OK. For a second, the thought crosses my mind that perhaps she'll tell her family she's flying back to America and then catch another plane to Morocco. Except for one of her sisters, she's lied to her whole family about going to Ibiza. These fears are unfounded. After 12 days of complete silence, Luciana calls from the airport in Madrid to to say she's flying back home. We speak for all of five seconds. When she has the will, she can contact me at any moment. In little more than eight hours, her plane will touch down. I've protected myself, and now I try to distract myself. The medicine cabinet has arrived, and in an effort to prove I've made good progress on the renovation of the apartment, I spend most of the afternoon drilling holes through tiles and installing the cabinet single-handedly. I also install it because I don't want a big mirrored piece of glass lying on the floor at such a delicate and potentially violent moment when she returns. I want the apartment to be clean. I want it to be nice and calm. I want to look good to impress her. It's a hot, humid day in New York, July 22nd, and once the medicine cabinet is up, I see I'm sweating hard from the work and in anticipation of her arrival as it has come out. By now, she's probably arrived at the airport. I don't know how she'll be coming from JFK, whether she'll take the train as usual or take a cab, so I have no way of knowing exactly when she'll get home. I know her plane has arrived because I've looked up the landing online. I don't want to miss her when she comes in the door, but I need to do something about this zit so I run up the street to a pharmacy to buy some Neutrogena pore cleanser. The turquoise cleanser looks beautiful in the new cabinet, which we will not share together, with mirrors reflecting the liquid from all sides. I clean my face, 
I put on an iron button-down shirt, which I know she'll like, with my best pair of fashionable jeans. I take a perfume candle, which she's bought, and that I know she likes, and I light it and put it on the coffee table. The smell of sweet incense burns slowly into the night air as the sun goes down. I leave off the lights in the small dining room so the mood is calm and not too bright. I leave on only a lamp and the candle in the living room by the couch where I wait for her, seated with my legs up on the table. I've turned up the stereo loud and I play a CD by Goldfrapp over and over. The driving beat of electronic sound, the high yet calm voice, the underlying powerful bass, the melancholy twinge to the entire album sedates, numbs, mirrors my mood and comforts me. I'm here, but I am in space. I'm present and waiting in this apartment, but I am thinking over the trajectory of our past. I am thinking about us in Spain and trips far away, and then I notice the bumpy metal texture of the coffee tabletop and the flicker of the flame in the glass candle holder. I fixate on these textures, these smells of incense, these surfaces, the nothingness of a moment, the feeling of emptiness of her expected arrival. What more is there to say except to play the funeral dirge, the end of our marriage? She comes in later than I expect. Her plane has arrived more than two hours ago, and even with immigration, she should have already been here. The music is loud. I don't move from my position. I stare forward blankly, lost in the music and in my thoughts and in the texture of the furniture. I hear the metal do front door faintly as it falls shut. I hear her put her bag down. I hear her move around. She doesn't say hello. The music is loud and she doesn't turn it down. She traipses around the corner from the dining room into the living room and she catches a glimpse of me and she turns around and goes to the bathroom. She must have jet lag. She goes to the refrigerator and pulls out a pitcher of cold water and has a drink. She's sizing up the situation, developing her strategy, figuring out her first move. I've said nothing so far, nothing negative, nothing welcoming, nothing at all. When I'm angriest, I'm silent, she knows. I'm opaque, waiting, watching her without any movement. My eyes cast forward, looking into the candle. She says, hello, and decides to try to act normally, as if she's just come home from a normal, quick trip abroad. I don't respond. She sits down on the couch at the far end from me. She leans her body away from me. She's tanned from being on the beach in Morocco. She wears a white cotton shirt, similar to the one she wore when she first seduced me years before. What has she worn for him? She leans back and begins to say something trivial and normal, and I interrupt and say, I want you to tell me the truth. I just want you to tell me the truth. She pulls her jaw up sharply, shutting her mouth, as if thinking of protesting, and then thinks better of it and realizes she's caught. So you already know, she says. That was so, it was such a mix of like pain and anger and tenderness. You know, it was an incredible reading. Thank you. Our final reader is Helen Elaine Lee. Helen is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. Her first novel, The Serpent's Gift, was published by Athenium, and her second, Watermarked, was published by Scribner. Her short stories have appeared in Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, Callaloo, Best African American Fiction 2009, and Solstice Literary Magazine. Her novel, Pomegranate, was published in April by Simon & Schuster's Atria Books. Helen is a professor of comparative media studies and writing at MIT. Welcome, Helen. Thanks to Anjali, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Anjali uh, and Whitney and the Arlington Author Salon, the Kickstand Cafe, 
and, and all of you for being here. So um, in Pomegranate, Renita Atwater tells her story of getting out of Oak Hills Prison after a four-year bid for opiate possession and of trying to stay clean, repair her relationships with her kids, own her love for the woman on the inside who has helped to inspire her, and grapple to accept and tell her full and complex story. And Renita's voice is intercut with that of a third person narrator who brings alive the history, revealing some of the pivotal moments in Renita's life at Oak Hills and during her growing up that inform her uh, present tense journey. So I'm gonna just begin with the end of the preface, uh, which provides the lens through which to read Renita's journey of healing. And here's the pomegranate connection, so, uh, or one of them in the book. So as Renita grieves the death of the mother who has pained her, her father brings home a pomegranate, telling her that it has some surprising and wonderful news buried just inside. She holds it uh, as her father eats dinner and talks to her aunt, waiting to open it, studying its scratched and ordinary skin. Renita muted their voices in her head, turning the pomegranate to take in its flat and faded spots, pressing on the sharp crown at the top. And when she was about to get up and wait on something else, he said, let's open it. Renita peeled back the rind and pried the bloodshot gems from the spongy membrane that held the whole thing together. She was struck silent, awed by the wild design of it and by the little bursts of sour sweet juice from the seeds that turned her fingers red. There was a whole world, strange and crazy beautiful underneath the skin, layer on crooked layer of ruby crystals and chambers like inside a heart. So, so in our hearts, alongside the losses, our abundance and possibility. Yeah, and sometimes our hands are filled with what we need, and that might be something every day or seemingly small or ordinary on the outside and wondrous within. So, so there's the lens through which to see the painful territory of imprisonment um, of the book and, and of our lives. And um, one experience to tie to the theme, theme of tonight, one experience out of which I wrote was my effort to earn Renita's story by volunteering for 15 years at several Massachusetts prisons and houses of correction, leading creative writing and storytelling workshops. So uh, here are the first few pages of chapter three, so after Renita gets out, uh, this third person narrator, and this flashes back to, back four years to the beginning of, of her bid at, at Oak Hills Prison. And I'm trying to keep to the 15 minutes. But, uh, all right. So this is Oak Hills 2015. When morning broke, Renita heard fitful stirring from the bunk below. Along with all the women down the tier, she roused beneath the scratchy wool blanket that had covered countless other bodies and faced the real, another day of human debt. Still, mornings were beginnings, weren't they? The nights began with limbo as darkness briefly tempered and then amplified the sounds of grief and fear and rage. And before things quieted to a low rumble of pain, she and everyone else at Oak Hills tried to refuse the noise and imagine a way out of no way. Just before sleep, most everything they depended on, outside and in, was burned away. Their threads and bling and cribs and rides, their weaves and manicures, their thick hips and cleavage and supple skin, their reputations and posturing and excuses, their legal analyses, the stories they spun and told about themselves, their charms in bed and service as adornments on someone's arm, their game, their talents for conversating and living large and staying alpha or beta, the jobs and comfort and respectability they might have known, the kids and kin who carried on a world apart, gone, and it was down to their gods and what was buried in their hearts to see them through to morning. 
All day they hungered and prayed the night would bring them peace. But for most, safety was a mere concept, and the night offered neither asylum nor forgiveness. In the dark lurked those who'd stolen innocence and trust. In the dark, past became present. Some things they tried to remember, the sudden light of fireflies, day lilies, hopscotch trees, and the things that remembered them uncoiled like ferns, elbowing out of winter mounds to unfurl their serrated blades. They went over there if onlys. If only I'd been born on a different block. If only I'd said no or yes. If only I'd never met him. If only I'd been stronger, braver, better, cleaner. If only I'd stayed home. If only home had been different than it was. If only, if only. If only I'd been more and less. For some, sleep finally came, and for those who were nightmare free, there was temporary freedom. Either way, morning followed, and they woke to find that they were still captive. The first thing Renita thought on waking was that she'd been inside for over three months. Spring was lost to her, March, April, and May gone. In one way, it seemed like each empty and lonely minute had passed at a slow crawl, and at the same time, she'd been through enough for a lifetime. Before taking on the fluorescent light of day, she spent a moment picturing herself up high in the spokes of the pine tree back home that she'd named Avery. Opening her eyes, she could tell by the striated light that it was nearly six, and she could feel it coming, the morning count, when her body would stand and present itself. The heart keeps beating, that's what her father had always said. She thought how they ought to give out chips for surviving prison. For 90 days in N.A., you got a green one, and she tried to imagine how it would feel to collect little bits of color just for keeping alive at Oak Hills, where everything except, except their skins was gray. On the van trip there, she'd squinted through window grating to see dormant orchards and pond-side cabins and rolling hills slide by pastel ranch houses, and colonials with gazebos and jungle gyms, red, white, and blue on porch front flagpoles, children playing in the snow and running free. The van drove past all of that to where people either couldn't fight living with a prison or needed the jobs it would bring, far away until the houses got smaller and smaller and the cars older and older and everything man-made was rusted and weathered against a backdrop of majestic hills and woods until it reached Oak Hills, far away from family, in the midst of all those evergreens they couldn't touch. The van had made its way through concentric walls and fences taut with coiled razor wire, and she'd stumbled off in ankle chains, surrounded by COs who couldn't have been less interested in her struggle to right herself, as winter blew through her orange jumpsuit and a cluster of geese looked on in wary curiosity. On floor buffing detail in an office three stories up, Naomi had chuckled as she watched her stumble, though she'd nearly fallen herself, stepping from the van a year before. She watched the door swallow Renita. A young poet coming in to lead a workshop saw the empty van drive away, another sister down. The chaplain saw her coming in as he was going out, another soul in need of sustenance. And C.O. Stewart pointed the way into reception and departure, another offender to be corrected. Welcome to Oak Hills, he barked, your home away from home. Nita heard the unspoken bitch in his tone and tried for the pride had, that had been sown into her, or for contempt as big as his. But dignity was hard to come by when you shuffled forward in chains. She held her head up and tried to look straight ahead, but on the inside, she was starting to unravel, riding the tail end of the high she'd managed to score before leaving the downtown jail. She knew she'd either have to find a source and fix or surrender to the agonies. Like others before her, she tried to leave behind her body as she parted and lifted and bent and spread and squatted and opened herself. She tried to disappear as her skin burned from the delousing soap, and she shivered from the icy shower. By the time her name was replaced with a number and she was dressed down and photographed, she had started shaking, 
And then she was marched to the holding cell where the fresh catch waited to join the general population. Back at the jail, she'd known some faces from around the way, but here she was on her own. Some in the tank looked menacing, some looked scared, some looked too stoned or strung out to be threats, and she knew she was headed in one of those two directions. What they say you did, one asked, with a smile that might be sisterly or not. Renita was inside the walls where the future had been settled and she'd be getting retribution instead of help, where everyone was in the process of surrender to someone or something. That night she gripped the tiny bar of soap and the stunted flaccid toothbrush she'd been given, hurtful reminders of the daily, and mourned the sweet release of dope. Lying curled and fetal above Naomi, she surrendered to darkness and memory and began to kick. Jerking like a tangled marionette, no methadone, no suboxone to be had, she gave in to the vomiting, the shitting, the hot and cold flashes, the shaking and cursing, and begging for deliverance. She kept picturing the busted Budweiser King of Beer sign at Mario's Paradise Lounge. Just like that, strung together with neon tubing, sections blown and sputtering, she flashed the news, help me, I am broke way down. She survived the bone deep ache and the crawling skin, the incandescent pain from just brushing her hair, the bottomless misery as the beast crawled out of her and she came around the turn. And when the haze began to lift, she felt each aching muscle, each joint, and each remembered sin. Coming out of the blind, stumbling fog to the truth of where she'd been, of what she'd done and not done, she saw herself and tried to bear the shame. She worked on shrinking her yearning and containing the cry that rose each time the cell door locked. She tried to choose sight when the real came back with a focus so clear and sharp that even the beautiful things hurt. She saw a red-tailed hawk from the window and had to close her eyes. Eyes open or shut, she could smell, smell the burn and feel the lift off as the dope entered her bloodstream, could imagine her joints loosening and the rhythm of her body slowing, smoothing out as she slid into the warm mind, body, soul, womb hug from the universe that she'd never be able to forget. God, how she wanted relief, and she knew where to get it. She'd seen the packets kicked under cell doors, and she knew which ones, the imprisoned and their guards, had access to the greatest escape of all. Still, here she was, a 90-day double survivor, and that was something. And there it was, the loudspeaker command. She stood and stepped forward, saying, here, present, 51673 Atwater, counted, checked, verified. Afterward, all down the tier, women dressed while waiting for their sallies to finish up with the contraption that was toiled on the bottom, sink on top, and all one piece. By silent arrangement, while one relieved herself, the other turned to face the wall. Then came the order for movement, and they went to chow. Eight hours later, after breakfast and work detail and another standing count and lunch, it was recreation time. And following the order to relax and socialize, they filed into the day room and tried to make this hour matter, or at least to help it pass, under the steady gaze of their keepers. Some walked laps around the yard, and some drifted like flotsam, disconnected, unclaimed. Some waited to use the phone that cost so much it bled their families even poorer, trying to unsee how the one at the head of the line looked even more heartsick when she hung up than before she dialed. Folks were gathered by the TV, tuning into the young and the restless or days of our lives. One woman got so worked up about the storyline, she yelled at the top of her voice about who was honest, who was faithful, faithful, who was about to get betrayed. Now and again, war broke out over what story to follow, whether some character or another was dead for real, or someone argued for a switch up to the drama of an up close at a, at a distance talk show feast of lives turned inside out. But today, things were placid in TV land. Someone was writing a letter. Someone was drawing a picture. Someone was writing a poem. Thank you.
Okay, we're gonna do a little, we're gonna bring three chairs up here, and then we're gonna bring the authors up uh, for um, a QA. and a uh, and I hope everybody has questions. You can ask questions to a specific author, or all three, whatever you want. Uh, so just give us just one second to just get that set. Okay, so if the audience will indulge me, I'm actually going to kick it off with a question of my own, um, because I was having many questions as we were as as we were listening to the reading, and my question is about um, is the is about the theme writing from experience, and I would love to hear all three of you talk about uh, the experience of 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 writing from experience and how that might differ from what you what you often do. All of you have written fiction. Jennifer, you said you know you, your work tends to not be autobiographical, but this time it was. It does you know is it more accessible to find to find that work from a personal place? Is it more challenging? How, what has that experience been like for all of you? I'm not sure who would like to begin. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, so because I was the framework anyway for Renata's story is imprisonment. Um, you know, and I had not been locked up. Uh, I, uh, I, it was important to me to, you know, do justice to that sto to that story. Although that's there's not a monolithic story there, but and, and also to not tell it in an appropriative way, you know, but to sort of honor what what I learned from the people I volunteered with. So, so, so that was different. I think that although I I had worked on a novel. Uh, Renata's story was part of a, a novel I, I wrote years ago that I couldn't get into the world, and so I had been working on that sort of issue for, for a long time. So, so that was unique, I think, and and uh, and um, I don't know. I, I think what writers do is struggle with something over and over again, and revise and go back, and um, and so you know that was unique. But but in another sense, I think we are always bringing our, our lives to what we write. You know, there's always a bridge to the character, and and you're always your own experience is always you know in informing it and in, informing what you write in some way, even if it's about people that you know for who the facts of their lives are different than ours. Um, so I don't know. That's not. Yeah, that's what I got to say. <laughs> um, I, I like a lot of fiction writers. I think I have a kind of a blinkered relationship with the truth when I'm writing. Um, I've been writing novels long enough that I feel like it all happened. Like I, I, I am not aware of having invented anything in this in the seven books I've written. At the time I'm doing it, yes, of course. I mean, I'm not psychotic, so I do know. Okay, this didn't really happen. But a strange thing happens when you know you spend five years writing a novel and living with these characters. It is as real to me as anything I have ever lived, and the characters I'm writing are as real to me as my own family. And I do not feel like I invented anything. And it, it really it makes me not trust myself in a way when you realize how memory is um, is such a subjective process. And wow, you really learn that lesson over and over again if you write fiction. Because you, you're borrowing from your own life, you're, you're distorting it, you're borrowing from other people's lives. Um, it, it's, it all kind of ends up in a soup. And you spend so much time so focused on it, like kind of with the concentration required to pray is kind of what fiction writing takes. Um, that I, I feel that I've lived it. It becomes lived experience. So um, I published three books of fiction before writing Wonder Travels as the first memoir. And I think one of the things that many fiction writers feel when they're writing fiction is that they follow their characters. They allow them to be free. And they, they, there are a lot of surprises that come to you as you give your uh, characters life. And as you, in order to give them the life, they have to have that kind of freedom of choice. And so a lot of surprise comes in that um, John Cheever never kind of famously never knew where his stories were going to go and how they were going to end um, and so uh, I think a very big difference with writing m memoir then is that of course you do know where things are going there isn't that kind of surprise but the surprises then come from trying to go as as deeply as you can into your own lived experience and as you go into that own lived experience, and as you try and um, the, the surprises begin to be what your memory can recall. 
the power of the subconscious, the power of recreating moments that you've already lived, but maybe you didn't know everything or see the significance or the, the patterns or how things actually happened. And um, so, for example, I mean, in, in the section that I read, I never would have thought about the textures of the tables and those kinds of things at that very powerful moment that I was experiencing, but later those come back as part of the subconscious. And then what, by the time you get towards the end, I mean, this memoir is called Wonder Travels, and the section I read you is kind of that immediate shock of discovering the affair, but then as the memoir goes on, it becomes also a very much a, tr a, a personal journey, a journey to um, uh, El Paso, Texas, and then into the Apache Kid Wilderness, down to Mexico, back to Spain, seeing some of my family, and on to Morocco, where, where I eventually go to meet Muhammad. And um, so in those kinds of scenes, um, you know, then you're dealing with what you discover. You can't make up and intensify things the way that you can in fiction, right? Part of the power of art is the intensification of experience. So we can't do that in memoir in terms of making things up, but what we can do is as we recreate the experience, we're using those novelistic and fictional techniques to create that sense of emotion and experience. And in that way, it's very similar. Um, we're trying to make you, the reader, feel what we uh, either have imagined with our characters when we're writing fiction or what we've actually lived. And in a sense, the choosing and the cropping of experience, that becomes what's so different in memoir, is that um, we must absolutely remain faithful to the truth, no matter how difficult. And, uh, but in the, in, in, once we choose what to go into, that's where we can become, um, to some extent, selecting, just as a, as a novelist would or a fiction writer. I guess I found myself wondering um, to what degree it was healing for you as the author to have that such an intimate piece of your life being so you know, public facing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this question about whether it's healing to actually write something that in a way is so personal, I don't, I, for me, the healing came um, as I was living the experiences of the book itself. As I was traveling, I began writing this memoir only, kind of unusually for memoir, only nine months um, into the experiences that I write about, which take place over two years. So I'd already gone through kind of the shock of discovering the affair in my own flailing in New York City, which was quite significant and, um, as, as, and in many ways was not my best side. Um, just trying to connect with other people and put one step literally in front of the other. And as time goes on, they're actually kind of truly healing experiences um, where I really start to get so much more into the powerful experiences that I was taking in, in for example, in Mexico, where I met uh, the cousin of someone that I was in a relationship with there, and he had gone through his own very difficult period. And what I found from him was the way I was hiking in the mountains of Oaxaca with him, and he was pointing out things like uh, the snakes, the mushrooms, um, we were walking with his dog. These kinds of moments vary in the present, or even a little bit after that, going to Oaxaca, to the beach in San Agustinillo, seeing this young boy who, uh, trying to make a living from tourists, but then boogie boarding in the water there, and seeing that, that kind of, trying to imitate that to learn from him, and being much more in the present then, that's what was healing. So it's not the revealing of the self, at least for me. I'm not trying to expose myself. I'm just trying to write honestly first of the pain and then the process of which I set for myself of going forward and having some amazing experiences. Tell somebody 
in advance of publication that you're doing it? You make this sort of feel like, hey, the person did something and didn't give me uh, that uh, same courtesy, maybe I won't. Or, anyway, broad outlines, you know, how do you sort of deal with it? You may be saying things or writing things that uh, you know, have this aspect of uh, yeah. Thank you for the question, and then I'll make sure that we have question, next questions for uh, um, for Jennifer and Helen. But um, in terms of, you know, I think the responsibility that you have as um, as a memoirist is to write to write as fairly and accurately as you can. We all have subjective experiences. Uh, you know, we're, we're all limited, of course, by our own point of view, but. What I mean is that um, even if someone has um, hurt you in some way, your your great responsibility, I think, is to try and see things from their point of view as well. Um, to recognize, for example, in this memoir, that you know any any breakdown, say, of a of a marriage is caused by two people. It's not as if there's one person alone who who causes that end. Um, and during the memoir, I try to enter into the point of view also of um, the person who who had been my wife, who I call Luciana in the memoir. And so there is a, a section of the, the memoir where uh, I literally, in third person, write, trying to imagine her own, uh, during a walk in Central Park that we had, trying to imagine what are her own dissatisfactions, say, with me as her husband, trying to imagine some of the things that she felt that she um, was not uh, fulfilled by, say. So I think we have that absolute requirement to be as honest and to, to the extent that we can as much um, looking into, uh, you know, fairly into the perspectives of all the people who are in a book. I'm not so interested in, um, I, you know, we each have our own lived experience and I think the boundaries are, I would never write about something that didn't involve me. I would never go write about someone else simply to, to write anything critical of them in which it had no relationship to my own experience. That would start entering something outside of what I would feel I had license to write. Um, so now I'm gonna pass this to Jennifer. <laughs> to tell the story with the help of the editor who bought my book and and I and um the, the challenge was to so originally it was all in the first person it was Renee telling in her voice it's her story of getting out and healing and getting herself together and and yet uh you know the first person limits you to the in a lot of ways it limits you to the awareness and understanding and veracity and insight and you know of the of the character and i needed to get beyond that to tell a fuller story because renita was just coming to awareness and so it didn't work you know it didn't work for her to be experiencing these th this struggle to you know uh heal and get back on her feet and and just and just coming to awareness about those things she wouldn't be able to she wouldn't have the capacity you know, to tell the story in, in its fullness. So the third person narrator gives us a, a wider, deeper view and is able to clue the reader into things that Renita doesn't yet understand or doesn't yet have the language for. So it turned out that uh, I, I wouldn't have thought of telling a story in this way, actually, when I, when I began, but um, it, it turned out that you got sort of, you got a, a more complete, fuller, deeper story with both her her voice and her insight and awareness, and then this omniscient, you know, God-like narr narrator who can see everything and, and who's able to say, well, here, you know, I say to the reader, uh, here, here are the moments that formed her, you know, that informed this journey, uh, this struggle with addiction and, and trauma and incarceration, so, yeah. 
I guess I can start. Um, my, I, I just I have a practice. I think you have to have a practice, you know, which allows you to deal with the uncertainty and the, the it's writing's hard. It's the hardest thing you've ever done every time you do it, right? And so I think having so my practice is not super complicated though. I have a place that feels open and good, and I first I do the New York Times spelling bee in the morning. <laughs> get things going and I do it in, in the morning before I do anything else because otherwise I go way astray and never you know and I just sit down I, I sit down and I whether whatever happens like sometimes you don't get brilliant insight and I, I sit you know so that's my but I also want to say one of the things I admire about Jennifer is that I just think she embodies like wh what the true you know writer spirit because she 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 works in a disciplined and regular way and and you know she just had this book come out she already has another book that uh, was was just sold and now she's working on another book and and I I'm also writing another so like I think I have such admiration for the 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 discipline the commitment because that's what it is you know you sit down and you work and you find a way to to do the next thing so. <laughs> um, I absolutely believe in showing up every day. Um, so I grew up in coal mining country in Pennsylvania, and um, my grandfathers were coal miners, and all the men in my town were coal miners. And, and so when I started out as a writer, I had a really hard time talking about it as work. Because if any of the people I grew up with could see a webcam trained on me while I'm working, uh, it would be completely laughable to them. So it was, it was hard for me as a young writer to, to talk about writing as work and to think about writing as work. It absolutely is work. Um, the hardest thing about it, from my perspective, is no one in the whole world cares if you do it. <laughs> Nobody. Your own mother doesn't care if you do it. She'll pretend to because she loves you, she wants you to be happy, she doesn't care. <laughs> Nobody cares. You're writing about made up stuff as a fiction writer. Nobody's waiting for your book ever. And so that is the hard part of it, that you, it has to entirely come from you. There is no, there is no waiting public ever. Um, so you really do have to show up every day. Um, I, I would work every day of the week if I could. I, I often do. I work first thing in the morning for as long as I can stand it. And you know, some days that's not very long, but um, I work as long as I can stand it. And um, you know, I, I, crucially for me, I have to be unreachable. So I can't have Wi-Fi. I can't have a phone. I can't be reachable by anybody. I have to be somewhere where the world can't get me. So I actually rent a space to go do this. Um, so I, I cannot be reached. And something about that has been very powerful for me to realize that, that I can you know, erect this firewall around the work I do. And um, that kind of makes it possible. I only have so much interesting to add to this. So maybe we should go to the next question. <laughs> um, and maybe just, yeah. this I think will be our last question. Sure. Mm. 
mean, these are all very, you know, hard questions to answer. Um, I only write one thing at a time. I am constitutionally monogamous in my writing. I can't even read two books at once, never mind write two at once. So I'm absolutely faithful to what I'm writing, um, sometimes to a fault. I once spent a solid year working on a novel, wrote every single day. It was the year in which I didn't write a book review, I didn't write a short story, I didn't teach a class. I did nothing but write this novel, which was terrible and I threw it away. So these are the dangers of monogamy, right? Um, so I write one thing at a time. Sometimes they go down in flames, but uh, mercifully so far that's only happened once. Um, and how do you know when you're done? Mm, how do you know when you're in love? You know, it's, you, you know. Um, I, I feel that I, I reach a point of satisfaction with the story that, that I have told the story I wanted to tell. Even if I didn't know that's what it was, I have landed upon it, and, and it's, a, it's a kind of an emotional response, knowing when you're done. Um, the hardest thing for me is finishing, it really, um, because I, I, this chasm opens up in my life. When I'm writing, my life makes perfect sense, and when I'm not writing, it makes no sense. It's, it's completely binary in that way. So the loss of finishing a book is, is that's always psychically difficult territory for me. I always feel much better if I'm fighting with a novel, even if it's going badly. I, I, I prefer that to not having one. Thank you guys, everyone, for coming.